Hey guys, what's up? I'm going to go right into what I had promised in my last video about how pretty much society and the way we set it up is pretty much like a game. But I'm also going to use it as a launching point to address some of the things that I've been seeing under the last video I put up. Because apparently you guys have no freaking clue, well not all of you, but a couple of you people have no freaking clue, or at least have completely forgotten why a society comes together in the first place. And you also seem to be under the gross misapprehension that when I say society, I'm somehow meaning state. And when I'm talking about sharing resources, I mean the exact same thing as a state misappropriating your taxes to do things like go uh, um, do wars on other people or force you to do things you don't want to do. If you guys have completely lost sight of why society comes together in the first place and think that I happen to be advocating a statist argument by just mentioning that you're supposed to share resources in order for society to function, quite frankly, I really question your ability to even have a discussion on coming up with a, um, a fair-minded society that's free and equal for all. Honestly, I really question whether you're mentally equipped to do this because if you think that I'm equating a status argument by mentioning that society can't function without people being able to share the resources and the fact that peop the people come together for mutual survival and it has nothing to do with altruism, you can't figure that shit out, you're not nearly as smart on this subject as you think you are. But I will get into that later because the point that I want to bring up about games leads into that point later. Anyway, life being a game. I know a lot of people always like life is not a game like the like this is real life you gotta take it really really seriously but the funny thing is if you look at the way kids interact with one another when they're first starting out and the games they play with each other and in, in, in that type of stuff and how they learn and then you look at the way we interact with each other in so-called real life and in society today there's a lot of parallels there's a lot of similarities because quite frankly much of what we learn about life we learn through play as kids Think about it. It's in the playgrounds and in the fields and the neighborhoods, you know, when we're playing with other kids, that we learn a lot of the basic things about life. For instance, we learn how unfair nature can be, you know, when you happen to notice that there are certain kids who might be faster or stronger or more clever than you are. Or how there might be some kids who are weaker or slower than you are who can't keep up with the others. Um, you learn about being diplomatic at times. Um, there's so many different kids who have different upbringings and different viewpoints, but for you know the sake of being able to hang out and have fun you got to learn how to reconcile those differences or you end up with conflicts or worse you end up with certain kids who are ostracized from the others because they're just too different we've all seen examples of that and either we've been on the receiving end or the giving end or we've just been we've watched it from afar um, and just like in real life you've seen like there's marginalized groups of people and you got the people who are marginalizing them and you got the people just on the, on the sidelines doing nothing about it just witnessing it you see that all the time. But the thing that I really want to focus on when it comes to games and society is how we set up the rules. Because that, to me, shows a lot. It exposes a lot about how, quite frankly, the way we conduct our lives is pretty much like a game. Because when you're a kid, there's so many games that we play with one another. And either they're games with clearly established rules that were made in the past, or they're games that we completely freaking make up as we go along. And sometimes those are the... Games that we completely make up tend to be, you know, of course, experimental and the most prone to, you know, failing that you don't want to play it again. But those also tend to be some of the most fun because you don't know where it's going to go. I think it's one of the reasons why Calvin Ball is so celebrated by, you know, the few people who try to play it because it's a game where you got to just make up the rules as you go along. It's a, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's chaotic and, 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 you know, you don't know where it's going to lead, but it's the experimentation that you know, is the most thrilling about it. And you probably can end up with something better than an old established game, which is why people, you know, jump on things like that. But there's, you know, there's not necessarily anything wrong with the old established games. Also, they stood the test of time. You know, you got games like baseball and, and kickball and, um, you know, tag and manhunt and, you know, hide and seek, things that, you know, kids play. And these games, those games I mentioned, all have established rules. And the kids agree upon those rules before playing the game. I mean, the kids come together and they say, let's play hide-and-seek, okay? And, and the kids generally know what hide-and-seek is. If they don't know what hide-and-seek is, and they'll tell them what the rules are. And the kid agrees with it. The group of kids, they come together and they agree on those rules. And then they play by those rules. And they, they agreed upon it. 
and they're playing for their own mutual benefit because they like playing the game. They get some enjoyment out of it and they get some mental stimulation and physical stimulation out of it. It's for their own enjoyment, for their mutual benefit to be sure, but they're agreeing on these rules not just because they make the other kid happy, but because it makes them happy. Now, the funny thing is, even with established games, we still find ways of putting our own house rules in. You know, like, you know, let's say you happen to be playing Manhunt, and you decide instead of it just simply being, you know, a game where one kid, you know, snatches another kid, and then it, Manhunt, by the way, many times it's kind of like a, a version of, of um, uh, it's kind of like a version of hide and seek and tag in that, you know, you, you find the person, you tag them, now they're on your team instead of it simply just switching hands, you know, you, you just snatching everyone up, but there's been variations on it in different house rules in the game. Like, I remember the, the version that I used to play in my old neighborhood, we had a jail. Like you caught them and you threw them in jail. And the people who were still out trying not to get caught could break the people out of jail if you were, you know, sneaky enough to do it as long as nobody was guarding it. That made for a lot of fun. And that was a variation on the game. Another place that you can see a hell of a lot of variation on established rules is role-playing games. Like, um, I happen to be a bit familiar with D&D, &D, and, and particularly the 3.5 edition. And, and no, I am not going to be getting into arguments about which edition of, Dun Dun of Dungeons & Dragons was better. I know the advanced people claim that their version is better, and the, the 3.5 people say that their version is better, and the 4.0 people say that their version is better. Though, to be honest, the, the 4.0 version sucks. If I wanted to play WoW, I'd play WoW. All right, I, I, now I'm adding to the argument. You know, no, fuck that. Stick with the topic. Um... D&D &D is a game that, you know, when I was messing around with 3.5, you know, it has its own established rules. It has its way of rolling up your characters and setting up your adventure hooks and, or your campaigns and how to go through the adventure and combat. But those of you who are familiar with D&D &D know that we fine-tuned those rules a lot, didn't we? We came up with our own house rules because the established rules didn't exactly work sometimes. I'm sure those of you familiar with D&D &D know the nightmares that could start just with these few words. I'm going to grapple. I'm attempting to grapple. The minute you heard grapple, you're like, ah, shit. Because you knew that the established rules made for a convoluted combat system when it came to that sort of thing. <laughs> Rolling for initiative and encounter moves and this kind of... We don't need to go there. You know. If you play D&D, &D, you know. So we tended to sometimes streamline those rules and come up with our, like, our own variations of it in order to make it work for the benefit of the game and the, and the benefit of the people playing who wanted something that was more efficient something that worked for the group and for the mutual benefit of those playing it. And we all had to agree on upon those house rules. Hell, I can think of like um, one in particular that was a little bit closer to my heart is the whole issue on half-elves. I happen to like half-elves and you know, I, I found the concept interesting and like trying to roll and play one. But the problem is, compared to the other races, half-elves kind of suck. You look at some of the other bonuses that the other um, races in D&D have and then you look at half-elves and it's like they don't really have much to really make you want to pick them other than for a role-playing reason but you know benefits wise, wise it's, they just had like a nerfed version of what elves had you know and the one that if I remember one house rule that I um, came up with and I got other GM's to do or if I was gonna GM something I would offer to people who want to pick half elves to give them extra skill points the same way humans did just not as much as humans got but you know just a few again if you know D&D &D, you know what the hell I'm talking about um, and many people like that rule. In fact, the one supplement that came out for D&D, which was all about making house rules, actually suggested that particular house rule. And now I think I revealed to anybody who had any doubts just how much of a nerd I am, but that's besides the point. The point that I'm trying to make is that even with established systems, for the sake of our own groups and our own communities or whatever, particularly the, in, for the people playing the game, we'll fine-tune the rules. And we all agree upon these rules. Now, all these rules for the game are obviously, you know, of course, a bit removed from nature. We come up with a bunch of abstract rules in order to work for the abstract systems that we happen to be working with. And society is pretty much the same way. It's the same thing. When we come up with basic rules on trade or we come up with basic rules on um, how families are to, you know, go about society or, you know... Um, like basic rules, like for instance, to stop at the red light and go at the green light. These are arbitrary rules. It's got nothing to do with nature. But we come up with this stuff in order to come up with a society that can basically function. And we agree with it. Just, you know, we go with it like it's a game. And just like a game, the rules can be stacked against us on purpose 
by rather unscrupulous people who basically twist the rules for their own personal enjoyment at the detriment of the group. How many times have you seen people when they're playing a game like Tag, they all make the fat kid or the, the least of the kid that's not liked it just to torment them because they know that they're not going to be caught. So they'll run around and you can't catch me just, just to torment that bastard. And that kid's definitely not getting any enjoyment out of it and all he's doing is breeding resentment that's going to backlash on them one day. We see the same things with society at times. So many different societies that they'll find a certain group of people who they will set the rules up just to marginalize them. You see this with kids in games and you see this once again with adults in societies. Setting the rules up to you know end up with a particular society that isn't necessarily for the benefit of all. But these are rules that, for the most part, people come together and agree with and pretty much just make up. And just like there are established games, there are established rules for certain societies or certain society structures. And this is when you start getting with, you know, different political systems and different, um, you know, communal systems. I mean, you've got things like monarchies and you've got, you know, this is, um, group of elders or council of elders or you might, like I said, you got, um, democracies or you got dictatorships or whatever you got these certain particular systems with established rules on how they think they should work but no one's particular system is necessarily the same one particular person's so-called democracy may function differently than another person's because of the way they fine-tune and tweak the rules for better or for worse just like the way we'd be able to do with a game because just like a game is just completely made up our society's rules are completely fucking made up but they're made up for the supposed pur like the general purpose that we do this you know is to come up with a system that's supposed to generally benefit people the problem is just like it can happen with kids where you'll have this one bully type character force the other guys to play a game that's only going to benefit him you will see this in society where they might sometimes set up the rules that it will only benefit them and everyone else is pretty much struggling or suffering and we've seen that sometimes like the bully will probably set a game up, so like let's say he'll set up a baseball game where it's just he and his his friends against a weakling team just so they can beat the living crap out of the weakling team. <laughs> I've seen that happen, you know, growing up. I mean, this, this type of shit goes on. Or, you know, maybe they're playing manhunt and the strongest and biggest kid plays manhunt just so he can pick on the smaller kids and toss them in the jail cell. That, or, you know, just constantly keep picking them and tossing them around. Again, that shit happens. And we see that in real life. And it's not for the people's mutual benefit. But this is what I mean when I'm saying that, quite frankly, it is a game, because just like in a game, we make up the fucking rules. In society, we make up the fucking rules. And that's the point that I try to impart on people. We make up the damn rules. There is no reason why, at some point, when you're looking at the rules, you go, you know what? That's not really working. Why can't we change that? You have that power to do it. A society has proved, I mean, many people have realized that they've come together from grassroots organizations and all this type of stuff come together. Like, we don't like this rule. We can change that shit. And there'll be other people going, no, no, there's a fundamental, fundamental what? We make this shit up anytime we fucking please. <laughs> and if this rule isn't necessarily working for the benefit of the people in the society, it should be changed. Now, of course, you got to be very careful that you actually are going to benefit society when you make that change, because... You might be fucking shit up. You gotta make sure. <laughs> you gotta make sure that what you, the change you're putting to your system actually works. Just like if you're play, uh, messing with the role-playing rules, you gotta make sure that the home rule you put up with doesn't completely unbalance everything and completely fuck it up. But still, you can make up those rules. And there's no reason why it has to be put in the hands of just a few to decide what the rules are going to be, especially when it's going to be affecting more than just that few. Which leads me to the thing that is annoying me so much about the reaction that I'm getting from the last video. Do you people know why people come together to form societies in the first fucking place? Just like the way kids will come together to play a game, it's for their mutual benefit and entertainment and enjoyment. People form societies for their own mutual survival and benefit. And just like how when people come together to play games, you know, they have to basically share things with each other in order to make the game work. Hey, okay, we all need to play baseball. Yeah, but I don't got my own bat. Don't worry, Jason's got the bat. Who's got the ball? <laughs> there isn't some guy going over there, hey, I earned my bat. <laughs> Why don't you have one? 
kind of shit is that? You guys want to play, right? <laughs> let the kid believe. How many times we keep telling the kids, hey, you want to play, let them share. But yet when so you become an adult, somehow that's taboo. Somehow that's wrong. Or worse, when you start talking about somebody who claims to be an anarchist, and I'm speaking those words very carefully when I say claims to be an anarchist. Somehow sharing is wrong, and also about the in the in the, in the individu um, about the individual, and then if you happen to be sharing shit, you're endorsing the state. Fuck you. Pointing out that a society needs to share resources in order to survive, and in fact, that's the very reason why people form societies to begin with, is not endorsing the state. Once you start talking about an abuse of state coercing people to give up their resources for the benefit of a few and for their own particular machinations, you're talking about a society that's malfunctioned. That's not what I'm talking about when I happen to mention a society. A society, a basic society, is when I'm saying that, I just basically mean people coming together. Got shit to do with an oppressive state. Once you start talking about that shit or oppressive governments, you're not even touching the subject I'm trying to touch on when I happen to mention that there's certain resources that people share for their own mutual benefit. And notice I said for their mutual benefit. This has nothing to do with altruism. This is not some bleeding heart shit when I happen to mention that when you're in a society, quite frankly, you have an obligation to feed the guy next to you. It's for your own benefit. It's so that guy later on won't beat the shit out of you to take your food because he's hungry. It's for your benefit. When I, for instance, am willing to share food with my group of friends, because we happen to be hanging out, because I noticed that guy didn't have enough money to get a hamburger, so I'll pitch in. It's so that that guy won't be hungry later on and thus be cranky or uncomfortable later on, which is gonna fuck up with the mood of us being together to, you know, in our friendly group. It's for the benefit of all, but it's also for my own fucking well-being. It's nothing to do with just being a bleeding heart, true altruism. There's no such fucking thing, please. The basic reason why human beings form societies in the first place is for their own basic survival. Human beings can't really function well on their own. And that's, gonna, that's by the way, another video that I want to put up later. This whole thing about the self-made man who's done everything on his own is bullshit. Somebody gave you something which, no matter how self-made you think you are. And this is not taking away from your own personal achievements, by the way. There's plenty of personal achievements that we were able to do. But somebody gave us the tool, either directly or indirectly. You couldn't have done that shit completely on your own. You didn't give birth to yourself. You didn't make your own fucking clothes. You probably, if you're watching this, didn't even grow your own fucking food. The things that you've learned, somebody else had to put in the book or tell you before you could think about it. You're not as self-made as you think. And this is the way human beings function. We function, our survival function is off of each other. And the way to keep that going is making sure that our society is able to benefit our each other for our very survival. And the best way to do that is sharing resources. Once you have one group of people keeping resources from another and coming up with excuses why they can't share it with the rest of the group, the society crumbles. You've seen this in history. I don't know why I have to keep repeating this shit. <laughs> And again, this has nothing to do with repressive states. Once you start talking about a repressive state, you're talking about a society that's already going down the tubes. It's already fucking crumbling because they're keeping the resources from other people and using it for their own fucking benefit without the benefit of the group. When I happen to mention shit like you gotta feed the guy next to you, this isn't talking about, you know, endorsing welfare and taxes. That's beyond that. That's an advanced version of that which has probably been perverted. I'm talking about the basic need hell the basic feeling of all human beings to share their fucking resources <laughs>